Hey all, here OS Reviews. In this video, we're taking a quick look at the Kyocera Dura TR. This is a rugged candy bar feature phone, aka dumb phone, but the reason why we're taking a look at this is because we checked out a few other rugged devices recently, including the Cat S22 Flip. So I wanted to see how this device in a slightly different form factor would perform in comparison. And it's also military specified for shock absorbency, it's going to be waterproof, dustproof, and in this particular instance it's also now extremely affordable. You can find it on the third party marketplace for as low as $10 a pop, making it essentially a freebie at this point. And otherwise, what's interesting is it is technically powered by a Qualcomm Snapdragon 200 series chip. So it's actually the same processor found on the Cat S22 Flip and even the Nokia 2760 Flip KaiOS phone also are powered by the same low-end Snapdragon processor. It's quad-core 1.1 gigahertz, and there's one gigabyte of RAM inside of this thing along with 8 gigs of built-in storage expandable via a micro SD card. So surprisingly it actually is quite capable for just a dumb phone or feature phone and that's because it is technically running on a heavily customized version of Android that has been more locked down compared to the Cat S22 so that it seems like there's a custom skin on top, there is no Play Store support for example, but it's still using the WebKit based browser so it's an Android-powered phone that has been purposely stripped back to make it more of a feature phone experience. Interesting, it has built-in Wi-Fi as well, in addition to 4G LTE cellular, so you don't have to use data all the time, in addition to built-in Bluetooth, and it also comes with a pretty large 2,900 milliamp hour capacity battery, so almost 3,000 milliamp hours, that is compared to 2,000 mAh being on the Cat S22 Flip. And as a result, the battery endurance of the Kyocera Dura TR is actually stronger. You can use it for in my testing well over two weeks of standby, and it's still kept on going. On the rear, there is a 5 megapixel autofocus camera with an LED flash. Again, the entire phone is super durable and easy to grip in the hand. There's an optional dock port just like on the Cat S22, so you can pop it onto a accessory for charging like a walkie-talkie. The battery and micro SD card can be accessed behind the back cover here. They're removable, but you have to use a coin to unlock it. And on the side, you can also charge this thing using a micro USB cable. So that is one aspect where I think the Cat S22 is a little bit more modernized using USB Type-C instead, but it is what it is. The flap prevents any water from getting in. There's oversized buttons here for the volume as well as push-to-talk walkie-talkie. That is a remappable hotkey. They all feel extremely tactile, easy to press. And there's an additional hotkey here on the right-hand spine as well. On the very top, there's a standard 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And the boxy design means that you are able to set the phone down onto the table upright by itself. On the top here, we have a 2.4 inch QVGA resolution display. So of course it is gonna be a little bit smaller even compared to the 2.8 inch panel on the Cat S22 Flip but it is surprisingly functional for just getting around the UI and doing the basics. LED notification light as well as the earpiece there, screen is protected by Corning Gorilla Glass, and a traditional T9 style keypad, which is actually a little bit on the squished side for the 1 through 9 keys, as you can tell there, for the size of the phone. Perhaps that's because part of the space is taken up by the front-facing speakerphone, which gets extremely loud, but overall it's still functional and the keys at least have a lot of travel and feedback. They are super risen above the surface, easy to press on, and are also glow in the dark, so easy to see in darker environments, along with the traditional four-way navigation toggle, as well as two hotkeys, and you'll also find a multitasking key here that brings up your recent applications as well as a voice command key here on the front, which interestingly enough isn't using something like Google Assistant as you might expect, but rather still a software found on many feature phones and dumb phones of yesteryear. So here's an example. Say a command. Call 123456789. Please try again. Say a command. So there it is. It is definitely not quite as robust in terms of you have to specifically say things in the syntax that it's programmed to recognize, but you are able to use this to play back music, call someone if you have a contact saved under their name, things like that. Now taking a closer look at the UI, we can still see traces of Android, including the kind of Wi-Fi logo as well as the airplane and battery status up top, but everything else, including the menus, have then been further customized by Curacera to make it look much more like a feature phone OS, something like Symbian from back in the day. We are able to see traces again of Android, including accessibility options, such as color, inversion, captions, 
which we do also see on more modern Android devices. So good that some of those features are available here as well, in addition to the standard wireless options, again, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth that we find, but there is no NFC for contactless mobile payment on this particular unit. Otherwise, we can take a look at basic utility functions, including a calculator and a unit converter built on in. Again, the whole UI of all of these apps seem to also be designed by Curacera, as opposed to be using the standard Google defaults here, which is interesting. There's a basic sound recorder as well. One, two, three, test. Example of the sound being picked up by the recorder. Let's see what it is like. One, two, three, test. So as you can hear there, actually very clean and crisp for just audio notes, which is good for a communication-centric phone like this. There's also some ambient noise reduction if you're in a busier environment. A basic MP3 player can also be found to take advantage of the headphone jack. Again, 8 gigs of built-in storage that you can augment using a micro SD card. An alarm can also be used on here as well. Very basic functions that we uh, have come to expect even on kind of more entry-level phones these days. Plus you can find a simple world clock here as well, a notepad that you can use to enter memos, as well as triggering a flashlight to illuminate objects in the dark. And you also have a few more settings in terms of brightness that you can make high, medium, or low. Furthermore, you're able to turn on a blink option if you want to have an SOS to get someone's attention, for example. Now the screen here, I would say brightness output is also satisfactory, though it is a TN panel. So unfortunately, viewing angles are going to be a little bit more limited. If you're staring at it from the top, for example, you can tell how colors do wash out a little bit more. But overall, if you're looking at it from the front or from the left and right, it still seems decent. You can also access something called Street Smart, which is essentially the navigation app, which is also kind of a relic of past dumb phones. Instead of using something like Google Maps, which is also kind of an interesting decision. Perhaps these apps are even less resource intensive, and that's why the phone still feels kind of snappy as you're navigating around. That being said, it is strange because I would think a lot of these legacy apps have to be then ported over to the Android operating system that this phone is technically running on, so there has to be some development work there involved. For what I would imagine as a more limited number of devices running on these apps from the get-go, since I can't think of really any other OEM aside from Curacera that would still be providing those apps on a phone like this in this day and age. So it's kind of a strange decision in some part, uh, but overall you can also find a simple gallery, an email client on here as well, and we also have the browser, which is probably the most robust application out of the bunch, since it is technically powered by the same WebKit Chrome browser as on other Android devices. So on here you can scroll using the D-pad, also you're able to open up multiple tabs, which is again pretty robust for a phone like this, and under options you can also take a look at your bookmarks, enter a URL, zoom in, zoom out, so on and so forth. And as we start typing in an address, we can tell that this UI is super familiar to those uh, that have used any browser in Android. We have the same kind of menu system start to appear. So these traces become more apparent. And now this clip is playing back on this tiny display of this feature phone. And we are able to also access additional context menus just by tapping on here. And here is the footage playing back in a full screen view. That being said, again, this device doesn't seem to have an accelerometer, and the screen doesn't intelligently flip onto the side, like on some of the Kiowa flip phones that we've seen. So you still have a slightly more limited, almost postage stamp size screen there. So not the best, I would say, for maybe if you are streaming back videos on YouTube, but if you really are trying to look up the news, weather information like that, that can still function, and just occasionally a few snippets, I guess, will still work. Plus you can use it to look back the gallery of uh, local files you store on the phone itself. Quick look at the camera next. It's very simple. UI doesn't give you a ton of different extras, but you can choose the resolution just by pressing on the 1 over here to dial into 0.1 megapixels or up to 5 megapixels. 3 here will turn flash on or off, and that is it. No other HDR or Pro controls, but kind of just gets the basics done. And for video, we are able to toggle between VGA, QVGA, and up to 720p HD resolution if you want to capture it when holding in this particular orientation by in 16x9, and then it just switches back into the lower res there. So taking a quick look at some of the sample images, I would say if there is adequate lighting, it still looks to be surprisingly decent enough for just, again, a $10 phone these days, and you can still use it to capture, you know, something in an emergency as long as you aren't too picky. Not a ton of processing going on to these photos. This is what the flash looks like, but at least it is functional just for preserving some quick memories. And like feature phones of yesteryear, you're able to share these by Bluetooth, email, or messaging as well. And speaking of messaging, if we tap on the kind of message field here, you are able to toggle into some additional controls, including 
uh, symbols as well as smileys and even emojis as you can see down below here up to 159 most common emojis that is so surprisingly some of those options for typing and texting can still be found on here different website URLs as well as even smileys using characters as you can tell there can also be done as shortcuts using this particular mode and Further down below, we can also look at selecting text. So if you want to copy and paste, that's also available. And by the way, this is what the auto correction with the T9 predictive text looks like. As you start typing, you'll see some suggestions pop up there that make the experience maybe a little faster. Of course, it still is going to feel more sluggish compared to QWERTY layouts, but still does a job for kind of quick messages. Now, of course, there is no biometric fingerprint scanner on this hardware, but you can access a password pin or lock if needed under security. And if we toggle into device, you're also able to change some of the wallpapers via some of the built-in gallery options. They all look relatively attractive, showing off kind of the vibrancy of the panel just a little bit more. However, it looks like the yellow theme of the menus there are still going to remain, regardless of what the wallpaper here on the home screen looks like. Another accessibility option include changing the font size, making it larger versus smaller, as you can tell there, can also be played around with. And then also the programmable hotkey push to talk whether you want that to turn on or off. For example, I've set it to trigger the flashlight by tapping on this for a few extra seconds, but you can also choose other shortcuts that are available on the phone, as you can tell there. So it is remappable. And in similar fashion, so is the D-pad. If you long press for the up, down, left, and right keys on the main menu, they can also open up four of your most commonly used programs. So here is just a quick example of that, going into messaging very quickly versus going into the calendar or jumping into the camera. So there we have it. That's the Kyocera Dura TR. It's a kind of mini brick of a phone, but what's really interesting is that even these quote-unquote dumb phones are technically running on a slightly more advanced operating system as well as more powerful specs inside than I think many folks would expect. Again, having a quad-core processor with 8 gigabytes of built-in storage, technically running on Android with Wi-Fi, are all nice modern touches. Out of the bunch, though, I would say this version of the operating system or really skin, I would say, by Kyocera is the most obtrusive yet, but perhaps that's by intent. They have purposefully made it feel as similar as possible to a real feature or dumb phone from back in the day, including porting over many of the voice recognition features that maybe people are used to, but at the same time also restricting you from being able to do more, such as modern social media apps. So it could also fit the purpose of being a digital detox phone of sorts if you're trying to purposefully break free from certain games or social media addictions. This will get you to do that while still allowing you to make phone calls at the very least. But still is kind of a neat hardware, I would say, as long as you aren't looking for more additional app support and features. But if you are, then I'd say some of the more full version of Android devices, including the Cat S22, might be a little bit more versatile for you. Though again, this can be just purposefully even more simple, but still having all the basics, plus really long battery life to boot. So you can check out more details if interested in the links down below. Surprisingly, kind of a good value, I would say, for just, again, 10 bucks. Uh, that has been the Kyocera Dura TR Rugged Candy Bar Phone.